Hey, everybody. Welcome back for another episode of Risk On, Risk Off. This is your host, Brian Hunt. And uh, today is going to be a very interesting conversation because it's very much geared towards the current state of the insurance markets. So if you're involved in the insurance markets these days, you know it's been pretty painful the past number of years. And this is what we call the insurance markets a hard market in the sense that it's hard to get insurance coverage for a lot of your exposures. Certain markets are easier than be or better or not as bad than others. I would say current trends, at least what we're seeing in my, my angle looking at the world, you know, things like workers' compensation aren't too bad. Um, but things like commercial auto, very bad with the umbrella and excess that sits on top of that. And then if you've been paying attention to the property markets, it's extremely bad. And as an example, um, recently last night in Waco, there was evidence of hail coming down the size of my hand. And that's not an exaggeration, anybody. And I have the photos and I'll post that on Monday. But hail came down in Waco the size of your hand. And I think it'd be pretty hard for us to figure out a roof or an auto or piece of equipment that can withstand that much ice coming down and at, uh, dropping at the speed of gravity. And so for many of you who are involved in the insurance market, you're thinking, when's this ever going to end? Is this any sort of solution that we can do to solve, bring down costs, help me save money? Especially if you say you look in the environment and you look at your loss histories and you go, oh, I've got a good loss pick um, compared to the rest of the industry. I'm pretty good or on par, maybe even better. But many of you who are in insurance markets who are probably going direct or talking over a guaranteed cost, you're sort of subject to the world of what goes on in the marketplace. And as I had, if any of you saw my recent risk on uh, 60 seconds of risk last week, I had some uh, adjusters from Engel Martin, and they've got clients in Florida that are seeing 200 to 400% rate increase year over year renewal. That's not an exaggeration, 200 to 400% rate renewal overall. And if you're residential in Florida and now California, good luck finding insurance. Carriers are just walking away. So for many of you out there who are talking about this, maybe you've heard this concept of there's an alternative risk financing called a captive. And that sounds intriguing and sexy because it's basically you're either going to a group captive or your own sole captive. I'm going to find a solution and get out of the market and maybe save some money too because I heard uh, captives are cheaper. Um, we're going to talk about that, that it can be cheaper. And you can save money, but if your press only underlying reason to go into a cap is you think, oh, I'm going to save money right off the bat, it ain't for you. And so I'm going to have I'm very fortunate to have this uh, my guest today, who's going to talk to you about specifically how when he started becoming the CEO of a trucking firm, he sort of inherited a firm that decided to go right into a captive. And so I wanted to bring him on board to talk about the ins and outs, the pros and the cons, the good and the bad, the ugly what it could be like to be in a captive. So I'm very grateful this opportunity to add Mr. Colby Bell to our presentation. Colby, how are you, sir? I'm good, Brian. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. And Colby, I'm really, really excited about this conversation. It's been timely when you and I first were sitting down in Fort Worth talking about this. As far as in our line of work, commercial property insurance is tough to get coverage for right now. Yeah. And then, yes, this morning it was announced that you I think it was a $400 million verdict was announced for the uh, the death that occurred on a crane collapse here in Texas. Yep. It's probably got a lot of people in construction pretty you know, concerned right now. Yeah. So, um, Colby, obviously, I, before we jump right into the captive conversation, I'd like to sure. spend a little time, though, about let's talk about a little bit about yourself and how you got to that point. And so, Colby, as we kind of I like to play this game or at least joke, you know, kind of like in the spirit of the old uh, education game, uh, where in the world is Carmen San Diego? So yep. where in the world is Colby today? Colby is in Plano, Texas, Thanks. and uh, working for a constructor as a uh, outsourced sales development uh, company. Good. And um, so, tell me right now, Colby, with respect to uh, your background, let's let's kind of talk a little bit about as far as uh, where did you grow up? How would you go to school? How how that sort of start? Sure. I uh, grew up uh, just outside of Monterey, California, so uh, native Californian, and we know all about insurance risk there. Um, grew up there, uh, had most of my young career uh, on the Central Coast, and then was recruited uh, by Foster Farms, now Crystal Creamery, to come run their distribution in Modesto, California. Did that for about eight years, 
and then was recruited to come out and be the CEO for Starlight and get them out of a, a pickle. And from, from there, I uh, have some private businesses that I've owned and sold those recently, moved to Texas and found my way here to Constructor. So let's walk back for a second because I you mentioned Modesto because I'm very familiar with Modesto, California, and there was a client back in my days at FM Global that uh, does a lot of winery and <laughs> has a very large winery in Modesto. A, a little bit, yeah. A little bit, yeah. And I, I've always been fascinated because, like, it's you know, if people go to California, you think of Los Angeles and the, the mountain, the beaches, the sands. You go to you know no, Northern California and the western side of the mountains. It's yeah, you know, it's very idyllic. It's pretty, and the weather's fantastic. It is funny how different it gets on the eastern side of the mountain once you cross over to like Modesto. Yeah, it's a, it's a little warmer, a little drier, a little less green. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's definitely it's ag country. It's where a lot of stuff happens, and most most of the the work that's done in California is done in that Central Valley. Excellent. So, kind of you, you teed it up there, and, we'll, and I'm Colby. I want to end want to talk to you about what you're doing with Constructor because I think a lot of my clients or people attending who are involved in the construction world, love a little more about what that is. But, mm -hmm. you know, as we talked about here, I really want to talk to you about this concept of captives. And rather than having, I think it'd be best for people who want to hear, rather than have me as a broker or an underwriter or even a provider or a captive talk to you about it, I, I thought people might want to hear the nitty gritty about sure. what it was to like to be in a captive. So let's rewind the clock a little bit. Sure. So you're at, I think it was looking at your LinkedIn profile, you're at working for Better You Fitness. You're the founder and president of that. And then- yeah. Up along came this opportunity to be with um, Timmerman Starlight Trucking. Tell us how that sort of started off. Well, I, I was at the time I was actually with Crystal Creamery. Better You Fitness was kind of a hobby job in between. Um, but yeah, so I was at Crystal Creamery. I was running their operations. I had about 300 trucks, a union shop. We were actually a self-insured organization, so totally okay. different discussion. Um, the owner of Timmerman uh, passed away suddenly, and they went through a couple different iterations of leadership. And one of my former executives that I had worked with said, hey, this company's in trouble. They need a little help. Uh, what do you think? And so I uh, took a shot and said, I'm going to give it a shot and see what I can do as an executive and uh, stepped into the role of CEO at, at Starlight. Fantastic. So uh, you jump in yep. and obviously you're probably getting your hands dirty. So let's maybe if you maybe talk about as you saw what the trucking, which I mean, you know, so, trucking is a tough occupancy to try to get insurance for. That, that can be very tough, especially these days. Yes. And maybe maybe 10 years ago, maybe five years, maybe a little better. Yeah. So you get in, you jump in, you see the insurance structure. Yeah. What, what was your initial impression? Or even look at the loss runs if you went that far back. What was that like? Well, at the time, the loss runs were not very good. Uh, our X mod was over one. Um, we, were, we were really having a lot of issues. Um, the company was kind of known for having trucks on the side of the road and DOT stops and those kind of things. Um, and having come from a, a safety culture at Crystal, Crystal Creamery, it was kind of a shock. And then looking at the premium, because the initial premium of a captive is higher than your typical conventional insurance. It's just you have this loss fund that you get to earn back. So you're kind of betting on yourself to, to win. And unfortunately, Starlight bet on themselves to win with a bad hand. So let's, you, you, you had two points there I want to hit now and make sure we reinforce. But at your prior firm, mm -hmm. you mentioned you had a culture of safety. I mean, a, yeah. a, a, a culture of safety. And by that, I would assume you had, you were serious about you had, whether it be you had a health and safety director, someone yeah. who was experienced, you paid them, uh, maybe you leveraged some of the resources you had from your carriers to try to improve work safety. Is that a fair assumption? Yes, we had we had a staff that was dedicated to safety and, and health and safety. So it was much different than a small business where it was just me. Okay. So you go to the small business. Mm -hmm. And when you go to the trucking firm, how many employees are you talking about at that time? So, uh, when I started, it was around 60. 60. And then how many trucks out there rolling around on a, on a regular basis? 52. 52. So let's, well, how would you describe when you first got there that safety culture? Um, it... I wouldn't say non-existent, but it was definitely um, it was definitely a one-man shop kind of feel. Like it was just kind of winging it. No, no true structure to the programs. It was just kind of like, okay, go out there, be safe, and no follow-up. And so, if, if you if I can ask a question, then obviously, if you say you can't answer, but fine. But would mm -hmm. you say like at that point in the systems, like were there? And I see this with other firms too. I'm, I'm just I think it's a great um, example of this. You know. 
doing background checks on employees? Did you ensure that you had driver's license on those individuals, run their, their driving motor vehicle record history? How would, was that in place? We, we had most of that in place, okay. although um, the rigorousness that should have been there probably wasn't as, as robust as it should have been. And then claims, I mean, they were, you know, a lot of small things, or do you have any catastrophic claims that had occurred up to that point? Let's just say that there were a couple things that caught on fire in the first year that I was there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so and you and correct me if I'm wrong, you joined, and they've already jumped into the captive, correct? Yes, they were okay. already members, yes. All right, so that was in the, within the first couple of months that you joined? They, like, how long have they been the captive? A year? A couple of months? Uh, they have been fully in... It, it, it might have been a year and a half, but it was it was fairly recent and it was unmanaged. OK. And so you, you part of this conversation, I can I'm going to sort of assume whoever talked to them about it, maybe to manage it. I imagine their premiums, at least were pretty overall with, before they went to the cap. They're probably spending quite a bit of money, um, yeah. especially especially on the auto and probably the excess in the umbrella. Um, and so this idea is like, wow, we can save money. We go in the cap. But can you think, looking back, was there much detailed analysis, whether it be a pro forma or a T core that was run or anything that was showing, you know, it's going to, yeah, you're going to save money on the premium, but it is going to require an inlay and not just, and not just funding, but health and safety and being enterprise risk management to really, if you're going to bet on yourself, you really got to prepare yourself. Yeah, th there was not a full thought put into the amount of uh, risk management that needed to be done, uh, the amount of mitigation that needed to be done. I think it was just a, a simple cost structure look in, in, in my predecessors in that, you know, I think they were paying five seventy five dollars on their conventional premium. The captive, after their loss fund return, they, they could end up $110,000, $120,000 to the good if, if they didn't have any losses. But they had not had a year without losses in 10 years. So it was bet on optimism, not on realism. Uh, and I think that's a fair point. I think that's whenever I talk to people about captives and I, I it's, you, you can't just think about it. It's saving money on the actual insurance premium because you're going to take a larger deductible right off the bat. Correct. And maybe Colby, like maybe if you go back in history, like, so for in the captive, how big was your deductible? We were at a 50,000. Okay, so in prior to that, I don't know if you had a chance to go do back look historically. That was a client on a guaranteed cost of maybe a five thousand dollar deductible. Yeah, mo like. most of it was five thousand. I think there was some okay. catastrophic that was ten thousand, but five thousand was the general deductible. All right, so then just so everybody kind of understands the, the, the knowledge and training here, so on a guaranteed cost with a small deductible, you're paying higher premium mm -hmm. because you're asking for guaranteed cost, but you're paying up five thousand. You go into a higher deductible, like say fifty, one hundred, two hundred fifty thousand your premiums come down because the reason for that is that the carrier is not going to have to pay as much on a claim because you, whether it be a deductible or a retention, you're taking first dollar on in your situation, the first $50,000 of a claim, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. All right. And so then using that, you're having to be, you got a lot more claims that you are involved with. And so right. in, in that situation, you're probably using having, I imagine the, the captive probably had a third party administrator or TPA. That was, we did. Yeah. Like, okay. Mm -hmm. And let's, let's, if you don't ask about that, how was that experience working with that TPA? Really good. Uh, okay. Still good friends with everybody in that group, uh, high good. quality group of people. We're, we're fortunate. It's not always that way. Not all the case. And I, I, yeah, I can tell you that there's the spectrum runs good to bad on TPAs and having yep. a good TPA can make all the difference in the world. That's for sure. Yeah. Okay. So then that's first year. And so talk about, as you were explained, or at least as you learned that you have the A fund and the B fund as respects to the captives. Well, and and the, the way that ours worked up was a little bit different than the typical AB fund. So okay. we, we had the first 50,000. So our premium was 461,000. And then we had a $189,000 loss fund. We had the first 50,000 of every claim. And then if it went over 189,000, we had shared risk within the captive. So we had a, a shared risk group so that if if we went over that 189, then we had to share that risk with the other 50 something members. OK, and so very good point. And I'm going to so I'm going to take this moment here as we call to my next question. So if anybody here watching has any questions for Colby, please go ahead and you can see in the bottom right hand corner, you can add a comment. 
And we're going to sort of rewind the clock a little bit where I had a, earlier, I mentioned the comment respects to uh, the hail in Waco. Well, obviously, Vanessa Ford, I know very well, lives in Waco. And yeah, you, know, you can tell you it was pretty crazy. Like I said, guys, it was the size of your hand. That's how bad it was for the hail. So, wow. Vanessa, thank you very much for uh, contributing that. So then, Colby, so talk about that component where and you know, people like you run a group captive. So it's not just you. Like an insurance firm, you're in a mutual like or other. You've got other insureds in this insurance yes. company. Rather yes. than like say you're going to people out there, rather like say you're working with a state farm, an AIG, Chubb, whoever, where you're one of 20,000 clients, you in this group captain were one of what, maybe is it 40, 20? Do you remember how many other people you had in, in your group? When I, I when I started, I think we we're at 42. And when I finished, we we're at 57. Okay. So it's it's a smaller pool, but you're yeah. still the concept, your diversification and, and your and Colby, was it a heterogeneous by that or homogeneous? Was it a diversified or were you all were everybody in that captive a, a trucker? All truckers. This okay. is very unique. It was an all trucking captive. Um and yeah, the, we we uh you know twice twice a year meetings where you had to look people in the eye if you were not performing. We we didn't know who you were, but we knew who you were. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's that's a good point. So then Colby, looking back on it, did you prefer being in a homogeneous, did you find it beneficial in the sense like I know some firms like to be in a homogeneous, like especially like one for us all general contract because everybody in the room is same association, you trade best practices and you have a risk control specialist that knows about construction. But the fight is you're all exposed to construction industry. There's a, you know, you know, you might be geographically spread around, but you're all exposed to the industry that is construction or like your situation, commercial trucking. Mm -hmm. Flip side, being a heterogeneous is diversified where you might be you. And some retail cars, uh, tire salesmen, and maybe also some florist. So that's diversification of risk, but you're not necessarily in the same industry, therefore not sharing best practice. I mean, did you have a preference? I, I'm actually pretty glad that we chose the homogenous route because trucking is such a specific industry with such specific needs and, and industry changes like, you know, telematics and cameras and things like that that a, a retail store couldn't relate to so having people that were living it and understanding it and able to bring their be best practices and and test and work through ideas together was very beneficial yeah and i want to go there's a great part i'm going to come back you mentioned telemetric and best practice so i'm going to circle back on that yep. so rewind the clock we we're talking about you have your losses mm -hmm. and if it stays in your group pool you're fine it goes into the it, 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 at your level. In the, if it goes into the the higher levels, everybody's sharing it, right? Yes. So, so when you joined, did you, if you don't want me asking, did your firm have to uh, tell everybody else we had some, like, look them in the eye and you had some big claims or in the vice versa? How'd that work out? We didn't have to tell them, but we were on the news, so they kind of knew. <laughs> <laughs> I guess when we there, they're figuring that one out. Yeah. Yeah. No, they weren't. They, yeah. Trust me, the, the phone was ringing. Um, but only the first year. We, okay. we had we created risk share our first year and after that we never did again okay and um how that like is, was that a eye-opening kind of you burn your hand you therefore you never touch the skillet again kind of thing or how'd that work it, it was definitely eye-opening i mean i knew from day one that we had risk and so i mean i was day one my my first focus was getting some of these things buttoned up and, and just small things like changing tires and getting some gps units on the trucks and yeah putting some cameras that could create some accountability. Um, but I also had great people in the captive that had some ideation on how they quickly made some culture shifts and, okay. and really was able to make some rapid changes that were pretty effective pretty quickly. So the, the, so like right now, especially in this marketplace, I mean, the telematics, the video, the cameras on the, that's almost like required. But back then, was that something that the carrier or at least your captive carrier required of you? Or is that something you started to, like, to engage in this culture of safety you did on your own? It was recommended, recommended until my last year. My last year, I was the underwriting chair and we made it almost mandatory that within 24 months, they had to have 100%. And when was your last year? Uh, 2019. Okay, so yeah, I would say that's when we're still really starting to see some nuclear verdicts on. Yeah, we were there. using uh, SDR cards back in the uh, the day on those telematics, so yeah. that's that's. How <laughs> <laughs> so, so first year you're in it, you're underwater, correct? Yeah, and then so then when did it start looking from your perspective? Start looking like okay, this might be the right decision. Uh, end of the first year, I was okay. starting to feel some optimism. You you could see a trend in your claims. 
you've got three pretty large claims early. So we basically ate up our loss fund in the first quarter. Okay. And, and then, then we kind of got a grasp on it. And then, okay. and from there it trickled down pretty quickly. And, and from that point, you know, we had a couple of catastrophics, but we also had cameras. So we were able to defend them. Okay. That's good. So that's actually, that that's a key point where you've actually had it. You put a get together a risk mitigation technique yeah. to help with any claim. And as a result, it, it that cost inlay, yeah, probably saved you a lot of money on a, on a potential claim down the road. I bet. Millions, millions. So there's it's a trade off, and that's why I think it reinforcing the fact is that if I tell people if you're going to go into a captive, it's kind of like going in the mob. It might be easy to get in, but it's really hard to get out. And we'll talk about the reason for that. But if you're in it, you've got to make health and safety, and you know, reducing your claims or reducing your exposures, it's it's tantamount because you are basically betting on yourself. Yeah. I mean, if if not, you're gonna have a massive hole in your balance sheet. Well, and and you're not just betting on yourself. You're 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 creating. I mean, there's 54 other people betting on you, and yeah. if if you're not doing your job, you're hurting not just you but other. Most of these businesses are family businesses. We're not talking about you know multi generational billion dollar firms. We're talking about 10, 20, 30 million dollar companies. Okay. So you go in. One year after when you said the tail of the first year, you're starting to see, you know, the positive stuff. Yeah. Um, when did you really start thinking, oh, man, this is really working out nice? Uh, the After the, the second full year that I was in and we got a $140,000 check back at the end of the year. OK, so let's talk about that. So how was that um, when you when you got the $140,000 check back and you go back and look, it's far, you weren't necessarily there. But when the, the concept of going to the group captive started, how was that? Was that you know, how was that explained to you as far as how that works? So we ran a three-year cycle. So I guess the hundred forty thousand was actually my fourth year because it was my second year running the company. But um, you you can see how you're trending in that year, and you know where you're going to be going. So it's a trailing three year in ours. Every captive is a little bit different. Some people go a little bit further, but we basically went three years, and then we voted on that commutation. At the end of that, we we basically sent the rest to coinsurance, and they bought out the the claims that were open. So your, your risk was a three-year window. And so in that second year, I could see that our loss fund barely had a nick in it compared to the year before where we were over by thirty or $40,000. So we had, we had made significant progress. Oh, great. So how'd that get that check look when you're talking to the... <laughs> it it felt pretty good and the owners didn't mind it either. <laughs> <laughs> so what exactly did you end up doing with that, um, with that check? Like, what did you do with the funds? Um, we basically just reinvested in the company. We, you know, trucking is a very capital intense uh, mm -hmm. industry, just like construction is. So yeah. it just meant a couple new rigs. And we were in California, so we were under the carb regulation where they were making us buy brand new motors for trucks that were perfectly fine. So mm -hmm. okay. yeah. yeah, it just awesome. got reinvested, unfortunately. Yeah. So then, um, and to your point, was your firm only operating in California? Yes. They, okay. they, they were started in California and had been there the entire 30 something years they're in business. Okay, very good. And so then now say year three and four, how is that starting to look for you? Um, mostly good. You know, we had some catastrophic um, multiple fatality accidents over the year three and four. And because we had safety pro protocols in place, because we had cameras, we were able to not only prove that we were not at fault, but we were able to defend it and we had an IIPP, uh, excuse me, that acronym always evades me, but the Injury Illness Protection Plan that was followed up on and robust so that when Cal OSHA came in and looked at our books, it was a two hour meeting. They said, we're fine, let's go. It doesn't go that way if you don't have that culture. Yeah, yeah, amen to that, amen to that. So, um towards your end of your stay and you and the company is was it sold or what had what happened to the company? We, we we sold basically we sold a, a really profitable piece of the business okay. uh, one piece of the business shut down and then we liquidated the assets okay and then as we start sex to that shutting down the, the assets and dealing with the captive how did that go along it actually went really well you know normally when a company shuts down there's there's a lot of problems that ensue from that you know and uh now that we're four years past, we can talk about it. <laughs> um, Fair but, you know, at the end of the day, when, when you announce that you're shutting the company down, that's where every swollen knee and broken shoulder shows up. And, 
because we had such a strong safety culture and we dealt with things as they happened and we every trip and every near miss and every little thing that most people would ignore mm -hmm. was dealt with we we didn't have that problem and we we also the company we sold it to hired every one of our drivers so that didn't okay. hurt we made yeah. sure that we arranged for that in advance but um yeah. it, it went very smooth yeah and, and I, you know I was lucky. I've heard horror stories of getting out of a captive. And that's that's yeah. where I was going to go with that. So, Colby, I think you've heard the whole stories, and I'm going to tell you the audience explain how it works, and then maybe you can help me put some of the actual real life material on the bone. Sure. So, if you're in a captive, you're obviously you've got loss runs and yep. large deductibles. I mean, yep. you got, and so people don't understand in a situation you have to let in order to get out of the captive or permanently leave it, you have to have the losses burn through or get cleared up Correct. and that can the pain on severity of the claim take years and that's why yes. as we talk to people in, in this industry when you have a claim you want to get that thing closed as soon as possible because the longer a claim goes on the bigger and uh, more impact it's going to have it, it there's the studies show that longer it sits in your books the more likely that number is going to get larger yep so and until those claims are closed and, you, and therefore, as a result, you're going to have to keep money or collateral sitting in the in the in the group captive until it's done. It, everything's closed out. So if you have this desire, well, I'm getting out of this captive, this stinks. I'm going to go back to being what I want to do. You might still have, based upon what's going on, five hundred thousand, a million, whatever, based on big sitting in that captive mm -hmm. until you clean up all the losses. And is, is, is from your perspective, is that and maybe you give some horror stories? Is that a clear uh, way to describe that? Yes. So we had to keep cash collateral and it was in the neighborhood of $200,000. Plus we had to keep our loss funds, which the, the, the captive hangs on to. You pay that premium as a loss fund for your deductibles and you don't get that back until three years later. So all in all, we were probably three hundred and fifty dollars to $400,000 in. And we are, this October, I will collect the last check from the last loss fund from a 2019 closure. So- as we said, it is easy to get in, but it's kind of hard to get out. And that's yeah. why making the decision, it's all about, it's the pro forma, it's discounted cash flow, it's betting on yourself, taking that money and investing in the firm to be more safety conscious, health yeah. and safety, not just write a check for insurance, you're done, but it has to become more enterprise risk management. You are going to take control of your risk profile. Is that, is that a good way to put it? Yeah. Yep. You have, you have to be completely invested to a, a legitimate safety culture, not just put banners up and pretend. Amen to that. So you've added it, you're done. You're not doing group captives anymore. If you were to look back upon it, what would you say are the things you liked most about it? What did you dislike if there's anything? Mm -hmm. And then if anybody's in or thinking about this, watching this now or later on YouTube, our YouTube channel, what would you tell them? You've got to think twice or make sure you, you understand this. The thing I liked the most about it was the group that I was with, we became family. I mean, when you're, when you're sharing that kind of risk and you have hundreds of thousands to millions on the table and you're working with other small business owners, these people are going to be friends of mine for life and still are. Just, in fact, my wife and I were just on vacation in Mexico and they were doing their meeting and we popped in just to say hi because oh, all right. these, these people are like family to us. Nice. Um, I, I didn't um, dislike anything, but I will say you have to be an advocate. So if you're joining a captive, you can't just walk in there and say, well, what they say is what they say, you know, because the, the person that's managing your captive, they need to grow a premium. And if they're not growing premium, they're not going to be compensated. So you have to make sure that they're growing premium with like-minded individuals that are going to fit the performa that you are, are doing. So I wouldn't say I disliked it because we had a captive that was very cooperative. They absolutely changed our underwriting committee, made recommendations, and they made adjustments. And it improved the performance of the captive significantly. But that is not always the case. So you have to be prepared for it. And then to anyone that's thinking about it, you really have to step outside who you are and and not say i'm a safety focused guy because i tell my guys to be safe you really need to almost have a third party that's uninvested tell you what your safety culture really is um, because we think that we're safe mm -hmm. 
until something happens and we realize you're not. And that crane operator is a perfect example. You get a windy day, a couple safety measures were overlooked and there was no accountability for it and you get a nuclear verdict. I think that's a great point, Ms. Mender, as far as the, the risk of inherent bias um, in the sense that every you have, you're all internally, you're all thinking everything's the, you're the cat's pajamas, no problems, but without having maybe a third party unbiased uninvolved or not going to say uninvolved who has no in, in skin in the game respects to your company financially, but can give you an honest opinion. Right. I mean, that, that's critical. I mean, because other than that, you're going to be like, no, maybe people might be afraid to tell the, uh, the, the emperor has no clothes. Right. Yeah. No one wants to tell the boss that he's wrong. Yeah. That, that's a good way to lose your job sometimes. Depending, yeah. how, <laughs> depending if, the, if the company has a management culture of you know, openness and feedback rather than just, yeah. you know, do it Absolutely. my way and don't give me any, 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 you know, any grief for it. So yeah. awesome. So Colby, um, that's been very helpful. So now let's talk about this pivot. You know, you and I met and you were with Constructor. So what exactly is Constructor doing these days? So Constructor, you know, this I, I really have enjoyed this transition. So I've always been an operations and a continuous improvement guy. And uh, when I met our president, Rob, he was really interested uh, in, in, in taking Constructor next level with operational improvements. But what we do is we take advanced data analytics and we marry them with really outstanding sales uh, processes. And we go out and find business for companies in the built environment. So anybody that is in the construction industry or supports the construction industry, we are able to go out and, and make connections and introductions for them. And how does that work? We do a combination of uh, mass marketing, um, we can do top of the funnel where we're going out and just trying to find introductions. We do appointment setting for the guy that's out in the field and uh, has the ability to close deals, but doesn't have the ability to follow up on his pipeline and make sure that he's keeping up with things. Mm -hmm. And then we use our tools also for full outsource business development, where we actually embed a salesperson into your team and represent your company and go out with our sales techniques because your expertise is in your business not necessarily in managing a pipeline and bringing sales in. So we take that expertise and bring it to your company. And is there a sort of ideal candidate as far as size, revenue, uh, industry, whatever? As far as I think the perfect size is that 10 to $20 million, but we've yeah. worked with, you know, half billion dollar companies down to startups and okay. we've been successful across all. The, the perfect size is the one that, that knows that they need it mm -hmm. and, and has the capital to, to keep it going. Okay. And I mean, because I, I think you and I talked about this, you know, construction is very much, um, there's, a, there's a tendency to do the old school method for the longest time. You're like, yeah, I've been doing this for 20 years. Well, why am I going to change? Yeah. Um, and slow to adapt te to technology. But I, I do think, you know, I've, I've come to meet people and talk like yourself. I mean, content marketing, LinkedIn, whatever you just want to use, YouTube channels, even Twitter uh, um, or TikTok. Um, I mean, it's a very powerful way to build your brand as far as to getting people to recognize or understand or have you sort of in front of mind if something comes up. I mean, would you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, impressions is everything you, you, if we send out 10,000 emails for you and no one responds, there's still 10,000 people that have seen your brand and now have a familiarity with it. I mean, even at your meetup, for example, they're like, Oh, you're Colby from constructor. <laughs> you're yeah. the guy that's been talking to me. I was like, yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, is constructor, uh, how long has it been around and how big are, what's your platform? Uh, constructor has been around for two years. Okay. Our sister company factor does the same thing for the manufacturing space. And they've been around okay. for about 10. Okay. And so we share the same office and um, a lot of the same ideas and processes. Excellent. Well, obviously, you know, everyone can reach out to you. They can find you on LinkedIn, correct? Yes. LinkedIn, Colby Bell. And uh, also Constructor has a LinkedIn page that we've got lots of content on. You can see what we could do for you. Awesome. Well, that, that, that's fantastic. So obviously, Colby, we're getting towards the end. I want to be present, uh, respectful of your time. Sure. But um, what I always like to try to do is understand people a little more about the individual rather than just the, um, the company. Sure. So, Colby, when you're not working, when you're not out there hustling, uh, what are you doing? Uh, I, I'm all over the place. So I'm a musician, a singer, songwriter, mm -hmm. uh, make my own barbecue rubs, like to cook a lot, all right. do a little catering here and there, uh, a lot of community service, uh, try and stay involved in, in doing things, uh, active member of my church. So I'm, I'm kind of all over the place. I'm artistic and logic and everything kind of all happening at once. So I, I I couldn't help but understand that you know looking at your background you went to um, 
you receive a certificate in Spanish from the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey, which is pretty impressive. So I, I did. I am fluent in Spanish, um, okay. which shocks people when I do it. But yeah. No. So tell me how that how did that experience go for you? Were you doing an immersion program at the institute? How that went? I, I did do an immersion program. I, I will tell you what happened. I was okay. a four point four student honor roll accepted to every university on the West Coast and a few beyond that. Mm -hmm. And I hated school. <laughs> and my grandmother was an advocate for education. And she said, you are too smart to not have a skill. Correct. So we're going to get you into this immersion program. Um, so she did two things that summer. She sent me to the Soviet Union. <laughs> wow. And I'm not talking Russia. I'm talking the Soviet Back in the Union day. Wow. a month before the coup. Wow. And sent me there for 19 days on a youth cruise to, to learn about the Soviet culture and, and kind of realize that what we have is not given. Mm -hmm. And then she uh, got me into this uh, immersion program where I learned and refined Spanish. I had, I had grown up in a Hispanic community, so I knew some, but it mm -hmm. made it much more uh, use, useful for me. Wow. Okay, so I got, uh, well, you keep on going with this for a while, but so tell me, what was your experience like in the Soviet Union? Well, let's put it this way. I came from America where we can go down the street and get whatever we want to watching people wait two hours in line with a script to get another script, to get a sausage, two eggs, and a slice of bread. Wow. And then was able to go to the new Pizza Hut that had just gone in and buy a full pizza and look out the window while people are waiting four or five, six hours for a single slice. What, now, what year was this? 1991. Wow. Just before it all happened. Wow, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, and so then, obviously, uh, being fluent in Spanish, how would you think that's been sort of helpful throughout your career? Well, it got me my first supervisor role because I was the only guy on the dock that could speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to help communicate. And I was just, I mean, I started sweeping floors and, and working the, the cool cold room, kind of moving boxes. And mm -hmm. a couple months later, I was a, a crew lead. And a couple months after that, I was a supervisor. And I just yeah. kind of kept working my career up to the point where I am now. So obviously, when you send me over your headshots, I like the one that you was showing, like you were singing. So I figured I'd go with that. So what kind of singing do you do? It looks like country western. But. Mostly country western. I grew up in the '90s grunge, so I, you know, I grew up with Sublime and Nirvana and, and <laughs> Alice in Chains and all that stuff. But you know, I, I'm not 20 anymore, so yeah, yeah fair enough. <laughs> Those are not easy to sing. So I put on a little George Strait and some some Tyler Childers, and I'm I'm good to go. Excellent. So um, as far as you know. You seem like an individual is pretty not, not afraid to learn. Um, what sort of uh, favorite authors, books do you are, would you suggest that you like your your favorite or your go to you recommend for somebody who wants to maybe you know improve Man, themselves? I I am so bad at books. It's okay. it's such an unfortunate thing, but um, my brain doesn't turn off. I used to be a reader, and I I read you know Carnegie and all that stuff back in the mm -hmm. day, and and I wish I could refer something that would be useful, but okay. I, I think the thing that guides me right now is the Bible. That's the only thing that keeps me going and, okay. and make sure my moral compass stays straight. Amen to that. What about podcasts? Any podcasts you like to listen to? Uh, I listen to a little bit of Joe Rogan here and there and okay. um, not, not a whole lot beyond that. Um, okay. Again, ADHD is not a good thing when you're <laughs> not able to focus. Fair enough. Well, Colby, hey, well, I want to thank you so much for volunteering to be on the show. This has been very informative. because I think this, you know, like I said, we could have somebody come on from a carrier or even a, a captive provider, which we, I might do later, but I really wanted to start with somebody who's actually lived it, especially yeah. one who wasn't kind of inherited it. You didn't really make the decision, but you had to jump in and, and get your arms around it. Sure. Because in this marketplace, it's still ugly. And the, the concept of take, going into captives to insulate yourselves from the market forces of insurance is not to say a bad thing. And I'm like, I said, I'm a big proponent of captives, yep. but you've got to take your health and safety seriously because it is, it is not a joke. You are betting on yourself. It will chew you up and spit you out if you are not prepared. All right, Colby, thank you so much for your time. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Brian. Have a good one. You bet. All right, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Um, it's kind of really, you know, conceptual. What is a captive? How's that going to look? But it's, it's one thing to maybe read a book or have someone give you the, you know, some material on it, but it's another completely different story to someone who's actually had to jump in, learn about a captive, and then wrestle it and figure out how it works. And I think the takeaway is this, especially whether you be captive or you're going large deductible, you have got to take your claims and loss history seriously because you are eating up. You are retaining a larger chunk of the financial loss that might hit you. Um, it is no joke. And like I've made the joke before, it's like going in the mob. 
once you get in, it is really hard to get out, especially if you've got loss runs because you're not getting your money out. You're not you get your capital back until you get out of those. Those gets burned through. So again, I used to work for a very large general contractor that had three billion dollar general contractor has their own captive is a behemoth and they ran everything through it. And is actually some people will maybe talk in the future episodes. The larger general contractors is actually the margins are so slow spend sometimes on projects. It's actually the insurance programs, the captives where they make their profits on. So it can be a powerhouse. It can help you and especially start building up that retention. It starts getting very large. You're building up your, you've got more, Hey, I've got more money, more capital built up. I can take on a bigger risk and it's a powerful thing, but you go into it thinking I'm going to save money and you're not going to take health and safety seriously. You just think it's insurance. You're not going to pay for risk for risk um, consultants or health and safety advisors or use consult, uh, third party consultants to improve your health and safety. Don't do it. Don't do it. it it's going to blow your balance sheet and it's going to kill your company. It's risk. You know, there's you know, risk. There's lots of ways to take risks and lots of ways to in the transfer of alternative risk management. But like anything else, you go into it, make an informed decision. So, um, Vanessa, thank you so much again. I hope you enjoyed this. And everybody out there who saw this, I hope you pre uh, enjoyed it. Um, if any future topics you want to see, please reach out to me. Send me a note through LinkedIn or um, you have my email or direct mail through Twitter or Substack also as well. And you'll be able to find this video uh, in the future posted on my YouTube channel. Until next time, guys. Thank you.